Hello, I'm Angela Prinswell, and my apologies, I had tried to get started earlier, and it appeared I had some technical difficulties. So welcome everyone to our webinar titled, What Should I Know Before Discussing Divorce or Separation from My Partner? I'm Angela Prinswell, and I appreciate you joining us today. I have a lot of information to share with you, but the goal really is how can I help you very early on in the process so that you can avoid mistakes and pitfalls um, that you know could be discovered later and may be harmful to your case. Um, I've been I've been a lawyer for over 11 years. Um, these days my practice is in the last over six, seven years has just been predominantly in family law. It's in 99% in family law. And a lot of times we have people come to us after the fact and, you know, there's the comment is always, I wish I had spoken with you or spoken with a lawyer earlier on. And I hope that today I could just really touch on some, give you some ideas of things to think about, um, you know, very early on in your, in your matter. You would have a chance to ask questions. I believe on your screen, you would have an opportunity to, um, you should have a section at the right hand of your screen where you can log, where you could type in questions, which I would answer at the end. And if for some reason I'm unable to get to your questions, we will send you an email um, after. And you can do that too. Send us an email um, if you have a specific um, you know, question relating to our conversation today, and I'll do my best to answer those. Okay. So um, step one what do you want? And, and that's a critical first step. And I know it sounds selfish because we're so used to thinking about what's, what's fair, what does the other person want? What would they let me have? And I want you to know the very first step and the most important thing I like to get um, from my clients when they come to see me early on is what do, you, what do they want from the process? So I say, forget about everyone else, forget about what's fair. I need you to clarify your intentions. The clarity of your intention is it's very, very important because once you're, you're clear on, on what you want, then it gives us a springboard to move to step two, which is why do you want it? Because the why and the what are just can help us in being creative. So you just trying to think about things in abstract and thinking about what would I be allowed to get and what's fair and all of that just really clouds our ability as lawyers to be able to advise you. The fact obviously that you want something and the, you know, the fact that it's, um, you have good reasons for wanting it doesn't necessarily mean you would get it or doesn't mean we would advise you to go for that, but it gives us a springboard to have a conversation with you and just you know maybe find ways that we can help you accomplish what you want because we understand what you want and why and why you want it and i know it sounds very simple but most people coming to us in the very early stages aren't really that clear for most of us um this is you know separation is unexpected it's you know not what anyone's you know if it's in a marriage or if you start um, a common law relationship it's really not something a lot of people think about and so when this um when it happens it's just they the no one's prepared with um options of what they want and i find that when people come to me and we can really clarify their intentions it gives us it makes it a lot easier so now after we've known what you want and why you want it then we begin to think about others but particularly the children you know, what if what you want would not, you know, be in the best interest of the children, for example, then that's when we begin to have that conversation. So let's, so now that I've gotten over that basic, what do you want? Why do you want it? Um, and ultimately, you know, how would it, is it something that's obtainable for you under the law? Or is it, what is it best for the children? Or is it even best for you, right? Because sometimes you, you know, you just need a different perspective. So now step three is when we get to talk about, you know, some, some, some substantive legal areas. And I have, I have some broad areas that I would like you to think about very early on in your matter. Um, and I'll just, you know, list them out and I'll go into details um, right after. So the first area for those who have children, obviously, is custody and access. And you also want to think about child support. 
there's spousal support, division of your property, and sort of what dispute resolution process you, you want to go through. But um, in terms of the substantive areas, um, let's start with custody and access. So what you want to think of what parenting arrangement would you like to see? Remember, step one is always what do you want? And so say you come to us and you're thinking of having sole custody of your child, for as an example, um, then step two becomes why do you want it? Or maybe you want, maybe your reason for wanting sole custody really just has to do with the fact that you, you think it's better if the child lives with you on a day-to-day -day basis and you're able to do, you know, day-to-day, -day, you're not able to take care of the child better on a day-to-day -day basis. And then when we ask the why, we, we might be able to uncover that you're fine with, you know, sharing decision um, making responsibilities, but you just want to make sure that when it comes to the day-to-day -day care of the child, that you take care of that primarily. So then, we, we, then we, we might look at that parenting arrangement and say, maybe you don't want sole custody. Maybe what you really want um, is just to make sure that the children reside with you primarily. And I know I know that's, that's an area that's very confusing for a lot of people. When they're saying sole custody, they generally mean primary residence. So in the most basic um, way I can explain this is when you speak of custody, just think about that as, major decision making. So not the day to day, not what the child gets to eat from one day to the next or, you know, bedtimes and things like that. That's not part of custody. Of course, the parents can discuss it between themselves if, if they want to. But when we're talking about custody, it's mostly what school do they go to? It's, so it's decisions regarding education, religion, healthcare, and extracurricular activities. So those are very major decisions um, that that's where we talk about custody. And then on the other um, on the other hand, we talk about access. Now there's a move away from the terms from the from those terms, and it, you know the courts and then the family law rules would be changing to more neutral terms because just having those terms custody and access um, just kind of seems to be, you know. In, increasing the problem and everyone just wants custody. And so you have that sort of mindset of I want sole custody when really what that was in, it, it wasn't really about custody per se. It's just really about parenting time and how the parenting is going to be structured. So there are changes um, in the pipelines coming to terminology regarding that. Um, but for now, you want to think what's the best parenting arrangement for, for my child and for my situation and myself. Do I want to be, am I able to work with this person? I can tell you right off the top that the courts like um, joint custody and you really would have to show that the other parent um, is just not able to work with you. It's not just minor disagreements that's expected, but it has to be, you know, very major um, disagreements um, between you guys in a way that affects the children. So if you're arguing all the time, if the other person is not responding to, you know, messages that you send and things like that, then obviously having joint custody where you both have to agree to decisions about the children may not be ideal. So you want to think about that. But if they're an okay parent and you're fine with them having an input on the big things, then that's obviously so custody could work for you. But then you want to think who is in a better position to care for the children on a daily basis. So you know, looking back in the relationship, how how who, who had the the um, main responsibility for watching um, the children, taking them for their appointments and things like that. You want to look beyond just what was happening during the the relationship. Now that there's a separation going on, is one party going to be returning to the workforce, for example? Because there are situations where during the marriage, one party was the primary caregiver, but because now there's a separation and that person is returning to the workforce, it might not be best for that primary caregiver to necessarily have the children most of the time if their situation is changing, right? So you wanna think about what access schedule would work um, better for your family, or in, I, I'd rather prefer to say actually what parenting schedule would work for your family. And, but you need to remember maximum contact principle. That's very important. The courts, um, 
want or the well it's in the it's in the divorce act and this applies to the family law act as well which is for which applies to common law spouses the there is um it's required the courts are required to ensure that the children spend the maximum amount of time with both parents and this raises all kinds of concerns we see you know we see parents trying to act as gatekeepers and there's accusations of alienation and things like that you just want to remember that it's it studies have shown that children thrive when they're able to have a good relationship with both parents but obviously everyone's case is you know everyone's case is different so if it's not appropriate in your situation then obviously you know it might be necessary for you to act as a gatekeeper and i and i'm doing the quotes because you know it's just you protecting your child it's your it, it, it's your mandate as a parent to look out for the best interests of your child but again you want to think you know the parenting schedule that i'm proposing is it me just preventing the other parent from spending time with the child because you know i'm hurt and things like that if that's the case then it's going to be frowned upon by the courts and you don't want to start um your court process with by giving the court the impression that you know you're not going to be um you know open to jointly parenting the children and um that could actually work against you you could actually find that the other parent gets awarded um sole custody if it's found that you know you're engaging in in all of in these kinds of um behaviors and, and being a gatekeeper to the children so that's a lot of time spent there on custody because it's important custody and access it's very very important the children are are you know where where there's children involved this usually becomes a huge factor in most family law matters obviously with child custody and access comes um child support so you have to think about you know where is the child spending most of their time a lot of people think you know if i fight for 50 50 for my child then nobody has to pay child support that is not true um yes if, if in all cases i should say if you're making this exact same amount of money then obviously um if you have the children for about 50 percent of the time each then you don't have to pay child support but if your incomes differ, then it doesn't really matter. So a lot of times I see people fighting for, you know, custody or to have primary residence of the children only to turn around and find out that it doesn't really matter and that it, you know, their support, um, child support obligations are no different. So you, there is, you have to look at what your incomes are and based on your incomes, there's tools online where you can find out how much child support you're supposed to pay based on your income. And then if the child's residing with you primarily, you would have to look at your, you know, the, the dad or mom's income, the other side's income to see how much they owe you in child support. And if it's shared, then you look at each of your incomes, how much do, you know, would I pay to the other person and how much would the other person pay to me? And then there might be a difference and that difference is called a set off amount. And that's what you have to pay to the other person. So child support and custody and access go hand in hand, but please don't make that mistake of thinking that because the child is 50 50 um, with both parents that there's no child support payable because that's not um, necessarily true. Spousal support is a big area you have to think about. Um, the fact that both parties incomes differ isn't um, doesn't give an automatic right to spousal support you still have to show entitlement. So you, to put this very quickly again, because I'm trying to rush through all of these topics in the few minutes that I have with you, with spousal support, spousal support is a huge area. You have to show entitlement and you even have to show the basis of entitlement to spousal support. And um, I mean, need is, is, is a basis of entitlement. If you're, if, if you're in a relationship and one person's making more than the other, then there's obviously a need on one part, and that might be the basis of entitlement to, to spousal support. But the sort of things that we also look at when thinking about spousal support is, um, you know, you consider the length of the relationship, the roles each parent had in the relationship. You look, you also look at, um, you know, were there any contracts that were that were made and if, if there were any marriage contracts and things like that they didn't address the issue of spousal support you also look at the economic hardship that 
the parties would, you know, that the party that's claiming spousal support would suffer as a result of the end of the marriage. In some cases, it might be because of the continuing care of children. And in other cases, it may be, you know, just simply that loss of um, lifestyle because you're no longer in, in the relationship. Another thing with spousal support that um, you need to be um, aware of is the fact that your spouse makes a lot of money is not grounds to, does not take away their entitlement to spousal support. So if you have one person earning $200,000 and another earning $500,000 in, you know, living in the GTA, it's easy to say, well, with $200,000 income, she's fine. She doesn't need support from me, but that doesn't necessarily work that way. If they have a strong compensatory claim or if they just have any compensatory claim to spousal support, they will get spousal support from you. And also, um, you know, if there is, there might also be need. So the fact that you're a high income earner doesn't, you're going to be losing the lifestyle if you were in a relationship with someone who earned a, a higher income than you. And during the relationship, you had access to, to their income. So obviously there's that loss of lifestyle and um, spousal support order could be made to, to kind of compensate for that. So but spousal support, well, and again, the last thing with spousal support is duration. So you have to think about how, well, how much would I be getting? Am I entitled to it? And how long? Now, those are questions that a lawyer might be able to help you with, but it's just something to put your mind to, especially if you're planning for your finances, you're going, if you're going to be moving, um, you know, how are you going to, whether you're moving now or later, at some point you have to deal with how are you going to um, afford life pretty much. And if you're the person paying support, you have to think of your cash flow. If you're the person that's, and same applies to the person who would be receiving support. So you just want to sort of think about what's the disparity in incomes. And lastly, spousal support and child support are kind of go hand in hand. Child support always trumps. So if, um, if the income differential is not that much, you may be in a situation where you have to, you're getting child support, but you may not be able to get spousal support because um, there's just no ability to, ability to pay after child support payments made. Lastly, is the division of property. You want to remember there is a limitation period for you to bring your um, property claim. So if um, you have six years from the date of separation or two years from the date of divorce to bring a claim for division or for equalization of property. Equalization rules do not apply to um, common law spouses, and you would have to look at the common law and um, with the questions there on trust, um, with questions and focus, I should say, on trust principles and on just enrichment principles. So that's that's the way the, the issue of division of property sort of dealt with, with common law spouses. And, and the goal at the end of the day is to balance the inequities, right? If you're not, if you're married, then it's it's straight out 50-50 division of whatever assets you've accrued during um, the marriage. If you're in a common law relationship, you don't have that automatic operation of the law. So the, the common law trust principles are able to address sort of that um, injustice and where appropriate, um, the courts will divide um, property among common law spouses. Lastly, what dispute resolution resolution mechanism should you use? You want to think about that. Um, you know, are we going to try to negotiate between ourselves? Obviously, that's the best, cheapest method. But is it safe for you? We uh, we're very concerned with um, you know violence and and domestic violence is a huge concern for us because separation periods. Um, usually trig is usually a trigger time. So if you have, if there's a history of domestic violence, I would strongly discourage you from negotiating directly with your partner. But if you're still amicable and you're able to have a conversation, then you know you may be able to kind of bring your mind to all of these issues and see if you could come up with with um you know a solution that works for you. Obviously you're going to get independent legal advice because we don't want you necessarily being taken advantage of, but it's a good start to have a conversation between yourselves. You could also have the entire process. A lot of our files get negotiated between counsel and you know both parties reach an agreement, make compromises here and there and it's over. Or we can, um, there's mediation 
with or without counsel. So you could, you and your partner could, um, you know, attend mediation on your own, or if you want to make sure that you have your solid legal um, backing, then obviously you're, it's encouraged that you get a lawyer. There's also arbitration or a combination of mediation, arbitration, and as a last resort, in my opinion, litigation, just because the court process is expensive, it's law, it's just a lot, it takes a long time. There's a lot of procedural hurdles that you need to overcome. And but in any case, you could just use a combination of all. So maybe negotiate some issues where you can, whatever is left, try to mediate it. You could do a mediation arbitration process. Arbitra arbit um, arbitration um, decisions are final. It can be appealed like any court decision. But once there's an arbitral award, it's a final decision and you could move on. Or if you don't think you're comfortable in that alternative dispute resolution space, you could just jump straight to um, litigation and have the judge decide your matter. So that's a lot of information that I, I know I've just kind of gone over in um, 20 minutes or so. But the whole idea is just to get you thinking about these you know, these broad topics and for you to be able to get back to step one, which is what do you want? And step two, which is why. So once you know what you want and why you want it, then we can, I want to be, you know, with these broad ideas in mind, then we're able to advise you and help you deal with, you know, the specifics of your own case. So join us next month. I would go, I'll take each of these, you know, broad areas and go more in depth on each area so that we can sort of walk through. And with all the questions that we've received, unfortunately, I can't take them now. We will be sending you an email with, um, with responses. So take care and thanks for joining us today.